This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business Week weekend podcast. It was a very busy autumn week for markets that saw the latest Federal Reserve rate decision with the FOMC holding firm for a second straight policy meeting, as expected. We also got the October government jobs report and quarterly earnings from Apple. And speaking of earnings, the increasingly high-tech agricultural equipment maker Agco gave its quarterly update. Coming up this hour, the CEO explains how the interest rate environment affects his capital-intensive business. Then the head of the family-owned car rental company, Enterprise Mobility, as it's called now, stops by with some key insights into the health of the consumer. There is a ton, Carol, that you can Mm -hmm. learn uh, when you analyze the rental car market. I feel like both of those conversations gave us a nice little peek into the economy. And then a bit later on, the North American CEO of alcoholic beverage giant Pernod Ricard details key trends. Peanut butter whiskey, anyone? Mm. Maybe not for me. <laughs> Maybe not. I've heard about this. Although there was a topic it. that definitely uh, plays to you. Uh, we also talked about consolidation driving the global market for premium wines and spirits, a sector valued in the area of a quarter trillion dollars. All of that to come. We begin with a story in the finance section of the latest issue of Bloomberg Business Week. And what we love to talk about the Fed's impact on the Treasury yield curve, it turns out there's another group of investors that seem to be playing a role. Interesting story with more on how hedge funds are driving volatility in the crazy during U.S. bond market, Bloomberg Markets Senior Editor Mike Regan and I turn to our colleagues, Denitza Sikova and Liz McCormick. Um, guys, so great to have you here with us. Denise, let's start with you. I'm curious about the conversation in the newsroom. Joel has a tendency to kind of walk around the newsroom and like kind of poke people about stories. How did this story come about? What was the conversation? Or did you know one of you say, like, you should see what hedge fund guys are up to? So tell us how this came to be. Yeah, so it came back to that theme. We've talked a lot about price sensitive and price insensitive buyers. So we wanted to look into who are really those new buyers. And hedge funds are a big part of it. And obviously, like, like if you think of uh, just generally trading treasuries and uh, think of it as the safest market and kind of a, a little bit slower moving market compared to, I don't know, tra- uh, compared to equities, currencies, I don't know. Um, so the conversation came, how has the day of those people changed? Um, and this is what we asked them. So uh, long tail alpha, uh, the, the veneers day is very different. Um, you know, the first anecdote is he wakes up every two, air, two hours to check the prices. Um, and, you know, it's being there on your Bloomberg terminal or whatever you check your prices all the time and following every little move. And then every small data release right. is very important and potentially it can make you move things. And obviously, like some of those trades are voice trades. Sometimes you have to be in the office and look at all those releases together, decide whether you have to make moves. And you can imagine this is very different than, I don't know, five years ago when the Fed was uh, such a big, important buyer and prices maybe were and uh, as sensitive to those things. Yeah, this is why I'm not a tail risk hedge fund manager. I need my sleep. I need That's time. why you're here I, with us. I, <laughs> well, li- well, I want to bring Liz into this yeah. conversation. Liz, because we talk about the extreme volatility that we see in the U.S. bond market this year. Um, so are they playing, are hedge fund guys and gals, if you will, playing a significant role in that volatility? Well, yeah, right. Is it circular, right? Uh, They like the volatility. They come in, they create more volatility, right? (laughs) Right. Um, So it kind of feeds on itself. And the more it becomes, and I have to do a shout out. I know Tracy Tracy Alloway at some point did a story, Treasury's trading like a meme stock. So we have to look that one up. But um, (laughs) that it becomes like, you know, what was it? Oh, I think Mike Regan must have edited one of these stories we did where there was other things that were like the hot things that were crypto. And now uh, look at this, Treasury's. Even today, look at the yields across the curve. It's like down, you know, Mm -hmm. over 15 basis points. It's crazy. So I think hedge funds coming in because there's more volatility in trading, then that adds to it. But they do kind of on the flip side say, hey, we're adding to the liquidity. We're, you know, making markets. And uh, Denitza knows today we had the refunding today and 
they had their borrowing committee, which the Treasury always does look into different things. One of them was like the demand base. And they brought up things that were in our story, not that it was from our story, but <laughs> that um, the buying base has changed. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have less commercial banks, foreign central banks. You have more households and hedge funds, you know, in, involved in the Treasury market. So it's kind of interesting that they brought that up today. Mike did call it a meme stock, by the way, earlier. Yeah, I, I really wanted to take credit for that. But of course, uh, Liz Tracy's way ahead of me as, as usual. But but Liz, um, you know, one of the sort of standard bread and butter hedge fund trades when it comes to the Treasury market is something known as the basis trade, which basically looks to profit between discrepancies in the price of bond futures and the actual bonds trading in the cash market. That seems to be kicking into high gear this year. And there, there's a bit of a backlash to that from the government and some scrutiny about what hedge funds are doing. I know it's um, created its own backlash to the backlash. Uh, Ken Griffin uh, coming out and saying, why do they care about this? This is sort of an innocuous trade that actually helps uh, save taxpayers money in the bond market. Walk us through the, the basis trade and why there is scrutiny of it right now. Yeah, in fact, Mike, you're front running another story I have coming up. Hopefully, we get it out before you do. But yeah, it's been interesting. Like you said, we've had the Fed, the BIS, a lot of regulators say, "Hey, we're worried the side of the size of this basis trade has gotten as big as it was like in March 2020, and we know what happened then." But yeah, normally this is kind of like you say, picking pennies up under a steamroller. You're shorting the futures. You're buying the cash. Uh, if you take it to, do, you know, to expiration of the futures, they should converge and there and where they see some discrepancies, some price discrepancies. That's why you'll do that trade where the risk comes in is that most of that is done using leverage, meaning using the repo market to finance the Treasury side. So you have the risk. That's what happened in like 2019, that repo rates go crazy for whatever reason. And you, you just can't keep funding this trade on the flip side. When volatility picks up, as you know, in futures, you, you tend to get margin calls. It's just part of the metrics. And uh, so if you started getting margin calls on the short side, so, you know, things can just go awry on both sides. And all of a sudden, you know, you just can't keep in this trade. Then there's a mass exit. That's where there's a problem when everyone's running on the same way. Right. And no one can get out. Uh, remember, Mike, in 2020, we had people saying, Hey, I had a good trade. I couldn't even get out of that, you know, because there was just no liquidity, right? Well, that's what I wanted to ask. Don't we want it to be a little bit of a sleepy market that, you know, foreign central banks and the Fed and others, you know, use and can count on to be kind of trade a certain way? I mean, don't we, uh, to some extent, Denitza, care about the composition of buyers or are we just glad that there are buyers in this market? We do care about the composition for sure. And obviously, like, just to give perspective, so uh, those big traditional buyers, including uh, the Fed, commercial banks, foreign buyers, used to account for 75% of the ownership of the treasury market. That number now is 55%. So this is a very big drop. Um, and speaking to uh, different experts who have been following this for a year, a lot of people say that um, in, in a case where there's a little, like a slightly bigger shock, probably there will be very sharp moves Moves and the market is more fragile to those moves that in it was in the past. Because obviously hedge funds are a big part, they're very price sensitive, but mutual funds are also um, growing fast, pension funds are growing fast, they're not necessarily uh, moving as fast as hedge funds obviously, but uh, are sensitive to macro events. So all those all those different participants are a lot more likely to react on uh, who knows the next uh, banking news or uh, oil prices or any of those little so things. Have, but hedge funds have always been a part of this market, right? It's they just have. now they're a bigger part. We know percentage-wise. Yeah, they have tripled in the past year. So currently they own 2.3 uh, trillion, which is close to 10 percent uh, of the treasury market. Which makes me wonder if it gets sleepy again, Mike. Do they just run in the other direction, right? Because well, they, well, they right. got to make and, money. Yeah, and it makes me you know the the dirty word in macro land is are you a tourist in this market yeah. you know are you really <laughs> okay. a macro fund who's used to this trade and, and knows what yeah. to do or are you taking risk or you're an equity manager you know i've seen a few headlines uh, out this week, Bill Ackman was was shorting Treasuries. Mm -hmm. He's changed his mind. He's he's now covering that short. Uh, Stan uh, Druckenmiller, a, a very well uh, known hedge fund manager, used to work with George Soros, was out saying he's very bullish Treasuries. So is that at least the tourist sort of mentality? Does it seem like the consensus is we've seen the peak in yields? It's now time to back up the truck and start going long uh, the Treasury market. Do you think? 
Um, I think the peak is for sure very important, but it's also very important that for a very long time it was the direction of travel was very sure. And um, obviously, like uh, tra- uh, the Fed is likely to continue rolling off its balance sheet. So them being a smaller portion of it guarantees more uh, volatility. Whether those trades are, whether short bonds will still be a successful trade, obviously this is this is going back to the debate where we've we've seen the peak. But the fact that they're more say relative value trades or th- or um, uh, you know basis trades or things where you can ex- ex- exploit that volatility uh, stays no matter whether we've reached that peak in yields. I wonder too, um, Liz, come on back in. I mean, what you make uh, for someone who's also followed this, you know, for a long time in terms of the bond market and treasury trade, um, to see a greater role of hedge funds, I do wonder, listen, they love volatility, right? They want things to move. That's how you make money um, and quickly for investors. But I do wonder, um, does that potentially, you know, or could it? spell treble. We always talk about, right, these changing rate environments. And, you know, as the tide goes out, like we get to see all the problems and we, you know, could it create some kind of crisis, mini or otherwise, in the future? Well, I have to say, and I wouldn't be doing a good service, and maybe Treasury Department will still talk to me if I do mention that <laughs> Josh, Josh Frost of the Treasury Department, the Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets, said publicly in a press conference, listen, we still have a very diverse buyer base. We're not relying on any one type of investor or group of investors. So they're saying, hey, we're, we're doing fine. But to your point, Carol, I think that is why regulators worry. Like they're zoning in on leverage and things, but you don't want a massive positioning in, in with one group of investors investors who, if they go the other way, you, you just cr- create this groundswell of movement and they take everyone else out in, in the process. So I think that's the risk. When any trade gets too big, especially when it's leveraged, that's a problem. But like I said, Treasury saying we're OK, we're looking at all this, but we still have enough folks <laughs> that want to buy our stuff that we're not concerned. But like, who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens <laughs> for now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's I wonder, you know, that that expression crowded trade comes to mind mm-hmm. uh, with a story like this. I mean, is there enough diversity in sort of the trades going on or is there a, a risk of crowding uh, in certain trades, especially, you know, when you look at how uh, the yield curve has really steepened pretty aggressively in the last couple of months? You know, is that is that potentially a crowded trade or, you know, are, are there any pockets of crowded trades we should? think about in this market right now? Well, I, I I would say I think the biggest one is the basis, even though some people argue there's reasons it's not as big. But we, I keep saying, like Denise says, it's a, it's this debate, uh, have yields peaked? And the, I think people keep getting burned, you know? Yeah. I mean, we've seen a massive fall today, but the yields have peaked. Let me just load up, bring up the truck and buy them. And then yields go up again. And so I think that's where the risk is that people are trying to they just can't seem to time this market right, you know. Um, so that's creating the extra volatility, not just from the hedge funds, but just regular macro funds, et cetera, thinking it's time. Now, maybe they're OK in the long run because this will come back. But I think that's the risk that people just well, can't seem to get a clarity for sure where rates are going. Yeah, right. Exactly. The crystal ball is really muddy right now. Denitza, um, just to bring it back to how you guys kick off this story and you, the founder of Longtail Alpha, um, in talking to him, does it feel like it's a trade he plans to be in for a long time? Or is it something he's like, yeah, this is maybe a one or two year thing or I don't know? Yeah, I think this is not including the story, but he actually said that probably the best time for this trade is yet to come, as, as huh. cliche as that is. But with, this is something we've also heard. We talk to people. Says the who, man talking his book. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, what else could he say? Uh, but we also talk to people like who are selling trading algorithms and who are very, you know, have a very good uh, perception where the basis trade is growing. Yeah. And they're saying that in the past uh, three months, they've seen the most demand they've seen uh, huh. for, for this type of thing. Things. And obviously, they have interest in saying that this will continue to be strong. Right. Uh, but this is this is a thing we're saying. Um, so for sure, there are numerous players in this space uh, right. that are saying that as long as there is uncertainty of uh, peak yields, as long as the Fed is rolling off its balance sheet. I haven't heard peak uh, yields yet. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we see yeah. that volatility, uh, there may be more appetite for those things. Feels like we could see some more vol- volatility. Um, guys, thank you so much. Bloomberg News Cross Asset Reporter Denise Tsukova, along with Bloomberg News. Chief Correspondent for Global Macro Markets, Liz McCormick. This story in the new upcoming issue of Bloomberg Business Week on newsstands tomorrow, already on the Bloomberg and already online at Bloomberg.com. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, shares of Agco, check it out, everybody. They're up for a third day. They're up more than 6% in that time. Company reported earnings yesterday morning, of which third quarter adjusted EPS was a big beat. Third quarter net sales in line with expectations. And the maker of tractors and combines also said it still sees fiscal year net sales of about $14.7 billion, slightly above street estimates, with fiscal year adjusted EPS of about $15.75 a share. That's 50 cents above the company's earlier forecast. Three analysts, nonetheless, less, cutting their price targets on the company by an average of 3.5% since it reported yesterday. So let's get to it. We have a great guest. We have the CEO, Chairman, President, and CEO at AGCO. He is Eric, and, um, Eric Hansotia. And, excuse me, Eric Hansotia. He's on Zoom from Duluth, Georgia, and uh, he joins us. Forgive me, forgive me. I'm trying to race to get to you, so I apologize. Um, Eric, all really, good. No problem. really great to have you here with us. First of all, how are you? And I do have to ask you about the Fed. In an environment where the Fed says, you know, we could still continue raising rates, we're still worried about inflation, does that kind of mesh with the outlook that you see? Well, your first question was, how am I doing? Great. Um, <laughs> just couldn't be happier with the progress uh, that our company is having uh, relative to our strategy. We're going to have $2 billion more in sales this year. We're going to grow margins significantly. Um, relative to the, and, and it's all in line with our, our high tech focus on being the industry leader in smart farming machines. Relative to the Fed, you know, interest rates do weigh on farmers' minds. These are big, uh, as they like, carry a lot of technology, they're expensive machines, many times half a million to a million dollars and so they often finance those machines and higher interest rates um, are part of the part of the decision um, i'm expecting that we're you know at a high plateau um, and that we're more likely over the coming year to have red rates go down than up um, and and that would be welcomed by our customers uh, you know eric i'm looking at the uh, revenue growth of agco over the years and really some impressive growth there 2021 it was up 22 percent 2022 up 14 percent 16 percent this year um it does uh at least according to analyst estimates look like you might be in for a dip in revenue last year and i'm wondering what's the what's driving that is that entirely an interest rate story or is there is there something else going on it's actually very little related to interest rates. Agriculture often is not connected, not correlated highly with the regular GDP growth. Um, it's more tied to the, the agricultural, agricultural economy. So the price of corn, wheat, soybeans, and, and that's uh, a function of how much grain there is in the world. For the last two or three years, there's been grain shortages. And so grain prices have been high. That means more profit for our farmers. Um, now they've had a, a great year this year in terms of harvest. And so there's a little bit more stock. Prices have come down a bit. And, uh, and that's really more what, what drives farmer profitability and in turn their interest to, to purchase equipment. Hey, Eric, what I wonder is longer term, how you guys think about the business, how you plan? Because I wonder if things like weather, climate change, demographics globally, is that more significant in terms of how you think about the growth longer term? And if so, what does that maybe indicate to you? Yeah, that's a great point, Carol. So we see three macro tailwinds plus this weather factor. So let me touch on those real quickly. Number one, we're moving from 8 billion people to 10 billion people between now and 2050. Number two, um, emerging economies are adding more meat to their diet. As they do that, that's a multiplier on the demand for grain. Uh, chicken is a two to one multiplier. Beef is a 10 to one multiplier. And then third is renewable fuels. So ethanol in the United States, but now the next one is renewable diesel. Ethanol consumes 40% of the corn crop today. Mm -hmm. Renewable diesel is likely going to grow to that same kind of proportion over the next few years. Those are all macro tailwinds that uh, cause the farmer to have higher yields, uh, more pressure on higher yields. And then weather is another one. We're having more severe droughts and more severe floods every year. That reduces the overall global, uh, global ability to produce grain. So you add those four factors together and the farmers are pushed to have higher yields while using less inputs, less fertilizer, pesticide, chemicals, and things like that. And so there's a big squeeze for productivity using our technology. 
We're using artificial intelligence on our sprayers now to be able to use vision systems to identify the difference between a weed and a and a plant as the machines going through the field and spray only the weed, saving like 70% of the chemical. Um, and, and a lot of uh, automation of features throughout all of our products. Eric, you say AI. I'm assuming you've been using AI for a long time though, right? Yes, we have. Okay. Uh, across many of our machines, we use AI to understand the variation in soil or crop and have the machine learn over time to be able to optimize itself real time in the field. It's amazing uh, because when mm -hmm. you think of AI, the, the last thing I think most people think of is, is farm labor. Don't and, you think of machines, though? I think of machines. Well, I, Eric made a great point, and I, I wanted to ask him about this. Is at, Right at the beginning, you said that technology aspect of your business is so important. Uh, and again, if you're not really familiar with AgCo, you might not think about that. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Eric, and uh, full disclosure, I'm not an expert on tractors. In fact, I, I hire a kid to cut my own grass, so I'm, I'm really... Sure. Uh, I've, I've driven a tractor. So a big one. There we go. So I'm coming at this from a, a pure ignorance uh, state of mind. But I would think that uh, self-driving technology mm -hmm. would be easier to implement on the farm with a tractor. But uh, from my understanding is it's not really. I wonder if you could talk to us a little about where you are with that type of technology. You know, will we, we see it anytime soon? Or is it just for whatever reason uh, too complicated to have uh, self-driving tractors? No, it's a it's a great topic. We it, it's at the heart of our strategy is putting technology on machines to have the machine be smarter and be able to do more things for the customer. I talked about the sprayer. We're automating all our functions on all of our machines. We've increased our engineering spend by sixty percent over the last three or four years since we started the strategy. We've bought six tech companies. We just announced the biggest ag tech deal in history with Trimble Ag, where is over a two billion dollar deal to bring those two their technology and our technology together. So technology is a big deal. Now let's talk about the autonomy question. Already guidance, which Trimble is, is one of the world leaders in, is used by farmers once they get into the field. They get into the field and they already turn on an auto steer, um, which is a satellite driven guidance, tip the steering wheel out of the way and the machine steers for itself. Now it's still supervised today, but most large ag has, is the machine is doing the uh, steering for itself. We've committed when we were in Wall Street last week, last year, um, we committed that by the end of uh, the decade, so 2030, we would have the full crop cycle, meaning planting, spraying, tractors, harvesting, all autonomous with no driver in them. Right. And by 2025, we'd have a retrofit kit that would be able to be put on an existing machine to make it autonomous. So it's a more contained environment. There's right. not so much other traffic and other things in the way. And, uh, and you can stop. You don't have a lot of other traffic around you. So you can, if, if it runs into a situation it hasn't seen before, the machine will just, uh, fail safe mode is stop. And then you can remotely view into it and, and restart it. It's like a boat, right? There's lots of move. <laughs> There's a lot of space around you. Autopilots work really, really well. Hey, in 2024, what do we expect for your company? Do you see higher prices due to inflation continuing? Yeah, prices are going to moderate. You know, our, our, these last couple of years, we put a lot of pricing into the market, more than our, uh, a little bit more than our cost. We expect to still put more than our cost into the market because of all this technology we're bringing and the value it generates. But inflation is coming down pretty significantly for us. And uh, so we think it'll be much more normalized. You know, we haven't given guidance, but it'll be more in the mid to low single digits than where we've been before. Any, any kind of peaks in terms of the ag machinery market? Do you see any kind of peaking out? Well, we've still got strong demand going into next year. Um, our order boards are out six or seven months on large ag. We're sold out for our seasonal products for all through body year 24. So we still see 24 is a good year, although getting more normalized. All right. Love it. Listen, come back soon. So appreciate it. Uh, Eric Hansodia, he is chairman, president and CEO at AGCO on Zoom from Duluth, Georgia. So appreciate uh, your time. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, shares of Hertz closing at a record low today. This after the company last week missed earnings estimates amid Tesla price cuts and then the high price of repairs for those EVs. Really eager to hear from our next guest about all things when it comes to the car rental industry here in the U.S. and around the world. Chrissy Taylor is president and CEO of Enterprise Mobility. It's the company, Carol, that until recently 
was known as Enterprise Holdings. That's right. They own National Car Rental in Alamo. Chrissy, by the way, the third generation of the Taylor family to run Enterprise. Her grandfather, Jack Taylor, founded Enterprise back in 1957, and his son, Andrew, was CEO before Chrissy. So it really is a family-run business. Uh, Enterprise, by the way, has a fleet of 2.3 million vehicles and 90,000 employees around the world. And we are so delighted to have Chrissy here in our Bloomberg studio. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm great. Thank you so much for having us. And we're excited about this announcement. Once Enterprise Holdings and now Enterprise Mobility. Why the change? Yeah, we have been moving, Enterprise really has been moving mobility forward for 65 years. And we are excited because all of our business lines, like Daily Rental, are gigantic and are a huge opportunity for for us. And so over 65 years, we have involved in terms of geography, customer segments, and products and services that we offer. And so when my grandfather founded Enterprise as a leasing company, we're now known as the world's largest just rental car company, we now have, we have car sales, a retail car sale op- operation. We've got car sharing, we've got van pooling and commuting. We've got a truck rental business. We have global operations. We have a hourly, we have luxury. We have a variety of technology solutions with partners. And so enterprise mobility better fully represents who we are and what we do today. I don't hear drones. Are there going to be drones? There today? aren't drones, but we are definitely <laughs> leaning into the future about yeah. what's next. So, so you're a probably- lot. You're a private company, so we don't get a good look every quarter, you know, under the hood, so to speak, Mm -hmm. of, of the company. But if you think about the whole pie, what portion of that is daily rental versus everything else you just mentioned? Because I think it's fair to say a lot of consumers know Enterprise for its core business. They do. The world knows us as rental car, and it is a majority of our business today. However, the original business that my grandfather founded, which is today Enterprise Fleet Management, has 675,000 vehicles, where daily rental in North America has 1.2 million vehicles. So fleet is half the size of our of our rental business. We've yeah. got 90,000 vehicles in our truck rental operation. And we continue to grow our footprint with retail car sales with over 150 dealership locations. So when we look across the enterprise mobility portfolio, there is a ton of opportunity, not just in rental. We love rental, but we are way more than a rental car company. And when we look at the future in growth, it really is in a lot of these other business lines where our people have opportunities to develop careers and stay with us for the long haul. It's well, great. Well, what is the most profitable part? of your business? So when we look across our entire business, all of our businesses contribute to the bottom line and revenue. And so we had a phenomenal fiscal year, a a record-breaking fiscal year. And so we measure that in terms of employee engagement has never been higher. Customer satisfaction around the globe has never been better. And those two things drive business results. We look at our international... Don't you think the economy also drives business? Absolutely. The traveler is back on. Yeah. No question. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no. Go, go, go. But I'm just, I, what we, Tim and I were talking and kind of getting ready. Like, we love companies like this because it does give you a great snapshot of the economy at a time when we feel like, Chrissy, we get such mixed data points from day to day, week to week. Mm -hmm. So the traveler is back on and we see that at the airport and they want to travel. The business traveler is back. Only 30% when we talk about our daily rental business happens at the airport. 70% of our business happens in our suburban market. Who are the people who are renting in suburban markets? We do have leisure customers. So when somebody's going away for Thanksgiving, they might drive from St. Louis to Chicago. But a majority of that business is long-term contracted business. So Bloomberg, when you're traveling for business, you go rent a car. We have many of those business customers that rent in the home city. And then we also have a large part of our business if you unfortunately get an accident you then your insurance company will refer you as the rental as we are the replacement vehicle and so it's long-term contracted business that we are helping the communities move let's talk evs how do EVs fit into the future of mobility? So we absolutely embrace the responsibility and the opportunity to transition our fleet. And we want to make sure we take a long-term perspective on that and strategic look and put the customer at the center of everything that we do. There are three things when we talk about electrification. One, customer experience. We want to make a positive difference in that experience for the customer because it is new technology and they don't understand. Most right. people don't understand charging. 
The second thing we focus on is power in our communities and infrastructure. So where are you charging in all of our local communities? And then we want to make sure that that charging, it's equitable and accessible because we have 9,500 locations, not just at airport, but in a variety of communities that people need access. And so for us, it's not about the numbers we're putting in. Yes, we've got electric vehicles in our fleet, but it is about making sure the customer has a great experience and we are a trusted value partner in that transition. Are you slowing though the purchase of EVs? And we're asking because it does feel like there's some momentum behind kind of a slow down. And Hertz talked about it just last week. Consumers, yeah. We have thousands of vehicles in EVs in our fleet, both in Europe and in the US. And our buy is a continuous buy. And so we will continue to add EVs, but it will be at the pace of our consumer. And also our fleet management business, it's really important. It's not just about adding vehicles into our rental fleet. Our fleet management business, we help small to medium-sized businesses with their goals. Domino's Pizza is a great example. They are an awesome partner and they are electrifying their delivery fleet. We are the fleet management company behind that and we are a trusted advisor and we love to play that backseat role to help Domino's achieve their goal of delivery, which is great. So it's about buying EVs, but it's also about being a partner mm-hmm. and a trusted advisor. Well, how many EVs do you guys have in the in the you know traditional rental car fleet right now? So we have thousands. So we have probably about five thousand vehicles in traditional rental, and we will put them in the we put most of them in our suburban market where people live and work. And do you see that number growing? How do you see that number growing over the next few years? As our fleet grows and as the customer demand grows, we will continue to add those vehicles into our fleet. It's just like a suburban. Are you thinking twice about it, though, after what we saw from Hertz, where they're saying, okay, you know, the t- value of Teslas have, have gone down, so that's hurt us as a business. And then um, the repair costs are more expensive than we thought. Does that make you think differently? So as when the customer demand, we will continue to move at the pace of the customer. No, we get, so so and, I guess what we're trying to figure out is like, are our, consumers demanding them less? The demand for consumers and EVs is very low right now. Huh. That is why it is important that that customer experience is on point. So we have thousands of them. We do transactions. People do ask for EVs. Right. But it's not to the point where someone is asking. The difference would be, or this example would be, a suburban rental over the holidays. We know everyone wants minivans and suburbans they're loading up the cars right. they're going on holiday some people want an ev that's not to the point of where we're at and so these fleet plans are very very important in our business we look at it every single day we want to make sure that we have just <laughs> like i look at the numbers <laughs> i look at the numbers we want to make sure that our fleet is diverse and represents consumer demand so that we can meet their their expectations and provide a great experience. And we have a huge role to play in that. So we need to be on point when we're renting an EV. It's not only just it's electrified. Right. These cars, have you all driven an EV? Yeah. Their, their technology is, this is a technical yeah, term. I don't know if I it's want off some the hook. Random it's very person different. getting in and driving it, it for can, the first time yeah. as a rental. It is very complicated, and the average age of a vehicle well, on fast. the road is eleven is eleven years. They are fast. There's a lot of technology in it, and it's electric. Hmm. And so we need to be very mindful and thoughtful of what is the customer experience. So I know I'm a broken record, but it is really <laughs> important that that customer experience is, is high and we do the right thing by the customer. Top of mind, when you look at the next six to 12 months, does recession ever come into your mind right now? We are very optimistic. Um, We do not see travel slowing down right now. And in all of our business lines with truck rental is a good indicator of the holidays because their last mile, they're delivering products and services that are coming for the holidays. And that business is doing very, very well. And we see a strong holiday. Daily rental, we see a strong holiday. And throughout um, the beginning of next year. So we are very optimistic about the next 12 months. Cool. Come back. This was really fun. Yeah, come hang out with us again. I think we're done. <laughs> we could talk so much more. It's no, it's like such a fascinating space, and we between cars, consumers, it's a lot of stuff. Um, but we've got to do some news. Thank okay. Will you come back soon? Yes, thank you very don't much. Go, don't jump yet. Um, we're so delighted. Christy Taylor, she's President and Chief Executive Officer of Enterprise Mobility, uh, joining us here in our Interactive Broker Studio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. 
Uh, so let's get to it. Max Chafkin writes about it in today's edition of... Those were his words, BW I should say. Daily. I was just reading right from this. Don't blame me for catching. He's probably at his desk and he just chuckles <laughs> his way through these things. Uh, it's the BW Daily, the Bloomberg Business Week newsletter. It gives you the power of Business Week in a handy dandy form. Sign up at Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. You can also read Max's story on the Bloomberg. He's here in our studio. Whoever thought Wikipedia? Well, you know, it's one of these, it's like a part of the internet that uh, I think we all take for granted that I, you know, have, I've been only been thinking about this over the last week or so because Elon Musk has spent a lot of the last week attacking Wikipedia. He's in a, a something of a tiff um, with he's the t- founder. Can I just tell you he's ticked off at everything well, right Well, he's, <laughs> he's tiff prone, we should say. Um, but in any case, um, you know, Wikipedia is, is super interesting because, you know, it's been around since 2001. Um, people who... Uh, um, are about my age, you know, I, I'm 41, will remember that, you know, uh, h- college professors, high school librarians were very down on Wikipedia when it was um, launched in its early years. Um, but but over the years, there's been basically study after study showing that it's, it's very accurate or, or, or compares well to traditional research sources. And I think really importantly, as you said in that intro, Tim, it doesn't it doesn't do a lot of the stuff that we've come to associate with the negative parts on the internet. There, there's no ads. There's not a lot of rage bait, and there's a real uh, care about about the truth. And, and and what's super interesting when you look at sort of recent research about Wikipedia is it's actually gotten less fringy over the years. Oh. So so our, nor- our our normal thought about social media is it sort of tends to suck people into these far right or far left or just weird and kooky rabbit holes. Wikipedia has actually become less like that, which yeah. is which is super interesting. And I think you know maybe worthy of a- acknowledgement if not outright celebration. So the question is, is how? Yeah, so it's a couple of things. I mean, one one big reason, I think, is the business model. You don't have this um, engagement-driven uh, uh, business model that depends on getting people to stay there for a really long time. So if your goal was to like maximize ad spend, what you'd probably want to do is have lots of uh, controversial articles about you know uh, about the, the the wildest topics, you know, so conspiracy theories or, or just like fringe stuff. Wikipedia doesn't do that. The other thing is there was a a, a conscious choice made by you know moderators the the these these people who work essentially for free to maintain Wikipedia to favor you know mainstream news outlets and academic journals over kind of what you might think of as the do your own research school of um, uh, of fact finding and that of course is in marked contrast to the trend that we've seen not just from Elon Musk right who's been in this kind of long running uh, battle with the mainstream media as he sees it but also Facebook and all of the other social networks they've all moved away from news they've all moved toward this kind of like uh, favoring influencers essentially over you know academic papers and and um, mainstream news organizations and I think that's had um, a negative impact on the sort of truthfulness of what you find on the internet not going to name names but I think it's fair to say that uh, people in the media business maybe a few on air you know anchors and talent occasionally are like oh Wikipedia I just been jammed a story like let me quick look, look there having said that is it accurate like is it reliable so and when you talk to people who've studied this the answer broadly is is yes, it compares well to you know traditional uh, news and information sources. That said, it kind of depends what you're looking at. So well-trafficked Wikipedia entries are extremely accurate. I talked to an academic, Amy Bruckman at uh, Georgia Tech, who said it's the most accurate information source ever created in human history for topics that are sort of well trafficked. And yeah. that includes controversial topics. So if you look at the page for like the um, the, the the war in Israel uh, uh, right now, you will see a, you know, a thorough, uh, fair-minded, very fact-filled um, uh, entry. For stuff that's more niche, where you maybe only have one or two editors, I mean, like it's Tim a lot Stenheim? less reliable. No. <laughs> I don't even have, I don't even think I, I have a either. Wikipedia. I don't well, either. Well, you're going to have to change that. Maybe someone, uh, one of these, um, you know, tens of thousands of editors can go and uh, do that. But, but it actually brings up a good point. Carol brings up a good point, Max, is what happens when maybe a previously unknown presidential candidate wants to jump into the spotlight and 
uh, you know, hires some interns to uh, go and try to, you know, <laughs> kind of uh, edit the Wikipedia entry a little bit. Yeah, you know, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy oh, got, got caught about. out um, essentially hiring somebody. This was actually disclosed on the Wikipedia page. Kind of love um, this. So totally above board. Um, but but I think this is a good example because he was called out, number one. Yeah. And number two, it essentially called attention to the thing that, that he was interested in, you know, kind of affecting the Wikipedia entry on, which which was this fellowship he had received um, from a Soros connected uh, nonprofit. And and I think this is this tends to happen a lot. People will actually get caught trying to manipulate Wikipedia. And it sort of does a Streisand thing where it, where it essentially calls attention to the ways that the truth is being manipulated. Explain what the Streisand effect is. The, I don't yeah, think no, that's the it. idea that when you deny something or, or you try to cover it up, it, it only calls more <laughs> attention. Barbara Streisand tried to, to do it with one of her homes, you know, years ago. And then everybody was like, oh, Barbara Streisand's home. Let's go find it. And, and so, and yeah, yeah so rich effect. guys and powerful people are constantly stepping in it, um, either trying to edit their own Wikipedia pages, that's like kind of amateur hour, uh, or, or like hiring someone to do it, um, which is the case that happened here. And again, I should say, this was disclosed, and that's part of why we found out about it. But Wikipedia has a very transparent system for showing you how stuff is edited. So you, so, so one thing that's great is that if some uh, false uh, fact or, or yeah. conspiracy theory shows up on Wikipedia, it'll be taken care of, it'll be disappeared very quickly. Um, that's the opposite of social media, right, where you see these kind of engagement bait uh, headlines and so on just circulate widely even after they've been debunked on Wikipedia they go away and you have this paper trail essentially where you can go back and see what happened so you can see was it deleted appropriately what is the truth of it and so when you get into you know well trafficked topics such as presidential candidates you you're not necessarily going to get the most um, the best written article right. but you're going to get something that is likely to to be mostly factually true relatively fair and balanced and importantly something that you can kind of audit yourself right there are these cit citations you can go through it you can decide hey how true well, is this how much do I trust this it's like amazing right in this kind of mess of policing when it comes to social media that there's kind of these Puritans <laughs> or AP, I don't know if that's the right word I know it, it not it's paid like very remarkable. idealistic yes. it's, a, it's a throwback to the you know, to the way the internet was in early Max days. doesn't have a Wikipedia page, but he's cited many times on Peter Thiel's Wikipedia page. I don't <laughs> well, know if you knew that. Max. I'm not noteworthy enough, and that's a whole. That's you another are, big debate that that happens in, on Wikipedia. In our minds, you're noteworthy you're, enough. I I, that means everything. We, also, read his book about Peter maybe Thiel. It's good. We could write. Uh, what, all I'm going to tell you is you also have to check out his story. Uh, either go to X or Twitter or at Chafkin or go to the Bloomberg or Bloomberg.com because there's just one thing in there We because we, this is a family show but about Elon offering a billion dollars, but there was a name change to what it would be called. So we're going to leave that on the table, shall we? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> It'll make you chuckle, though. All right, we got to run. Max Chafkin, yes, you deserve a Wikipedia page and so much more. He is columnist for Bloomberg Business Week. Also the author of The Contrarian, Peter Thiel and Silicon Valley's Pursuit of Power. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including an exploration of America's culture wars from our team at the magazine, specifically when it comes to schools, brands, and political candidates. Plus, the digital fundraising tool that helps kids raise money for school athletics, clubs, and more. We speak with the CEO of Snap Mobile. First up this hour, we've got a woman with some serious credentials in the consumer goods space, including stints in management with the likes of Kraft Foods, PepsiCo, and SC Johnson. Anne McCurgy now serves as CEO of Pernod Ricard North America, and this week she sat down with Carol and Bloomberg Market Senior Editor Mike Regan to offer her insights on the consumer trends driving a global spirits industry worth well over $200 billion. Well, uh, I want to start big broadly. The global luxury wines and spirits market is driven by factors such as the growth in interest in premium and unique products, the rise in demand for organic and sustainable products, and the popularity of experiential. And it generated more than $229 billion in 2021, anticipated to generate nearly $415 billion by 2031, a compound annual growth rate of about 6.2% um, from that tier time period or from 2022 to 2031. That's from Allied Market Research. So, 
big market, we know, we all drank a lot during the pandemic. We're still kind of figuring out what normal is post-pandemic. Um, so let's get to it because we have a perfect guest who is a front seat to this industry. Delighted to have with us uh, Anne McCurgy. She is CEO of Pernod Ricard North America. And as I said, joining us here in studio. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So great to be here, Carol. I love your background. Um, I didn't even know this term, FMCG, fast moving consumer goods space. Yes. So you've worked at Kraft Foods, um, sales, marketing, general management, PepsiCo, SG, SC Johnson, excuse me, um, really senior roles, global chief marketing officer, global chief commercial officer at SC Johnson, president of global snacks and global insights at PepsiCo. Um, what the heck <laughs> makes something a fast moving consumer good? Like I get it with alcohol, baby, but what makes it that? Well, what's interesting is alcohol is actually not not FMCG, it's well, just CPG. Uh, yeah. Fast is like stuff that just flies off in a grocery store, like Lay's potato chips, a, a thousand units per store per week. That's fast. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's, how do you then think about like something marketing, sales, that kind of a good, or do you mm -hmm. even have to because it just moves so quickly? It would just move so quickly. So, yeah. Where is it? In spirits, we don't move a thousand units per store per week, but yeah. you know, but we have very high price points. So even we might move not that fast, we make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, and I got to cut right to the chase. Yeah, screwball whiskey. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm fascinated with yes. it. For, for those who are unfamiliar, it's uh, peanut butter flavored whiskey. I, yes. I picture a commercial. You know, you got whiskey in my peanut butter. And I'm like, <laughs> you got peanut butter. Now I know uh, you guys acquired the yes, brand. We did. Um, I can't help but think, though, if so, you know, an R&D person in your company had come up with that, what your reaction would be. Because it doesn't sound like something that would be a success, kind of a surprising success. Exactly. It's like nobody thought people needed wheels on suitcases, but here we are. We're all <laughs> using them. So, yeah. you know, Screwball Whiskey, first of all, it's what an incredible gem, right? It, it was, before we bought it, the third fastest growing independent uh, uh, brand yeah. behind Tito's and Casa Azul. That's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. And the founders, who are amazing people, right? they gave their heart and soul into that brand. And uh, the reason uh, that the, the brand even existed was the founder, Steve, he is from Cambodia. And it came through refugee camps, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to make a long story short. No, he, no, it's a really fascinating it's, story. It's I'm actually such, glad you touched into oh it because the story is a beautiful story. So it comes from Cambodia. He has polio. His parents do everything to get him here. They live in refugee, refugee camps. Finally, they come to Houston. And the very first thing they give him is a peanut butter sandwich. I love it. And for him, peanut butter represents freedom. And so he has this passion about peanut butter. Right. And you know, then he gets into the restaurant business and he just, he takes Jameson, coincidentally, and takes peanut butter and like puts the two together and creates screwball. And this thing is, it's, it's electric. It went on fire. And, if, and the <laughs> reason why is because the United States consumer, A, loves flavored whiskey. Number one. Yeah. Number two, we have a very sweet palate versus the rest of the world. Agreed. So when people drink peanut butter whiskey with screwball, they're like, and then they put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God, that's amazing. I, that, that was my reaction. Well, you, you hear about it and you're like, wait, what? And then you try it and it's like, oh, yeah. We, we had, um, Where's, where have you been all my life? We had, we had the founders of Duke and Dame salted caramel whiskey. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And the same thing, we're like, uh, I don't get it. They actually brought us some liquor. I'm just going to put it out there. But um, no, no, no. Um, but it was really interesting. I tasted it. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm really not. But I mean, because I don't like whiskey. I like, mm. I like bourbon. Yeah. But I don't like whiskey. And, like that, just what it did to the tone in it. That's exactly what you are talking about. Yeah. So people are playing. Is it easier to acquire versus play around in the lab? You know, we do both, right? We um, do, because right? the other, you know, flavored whiskey that's been a huge success for us has been Jameson Orange. Mm -hmm. And this whole trend around old fashions and citrus and whiskey. And, yeah. and unlike other kind of flavored whiskeys, Jameson is very whiskey forward. But when you smell it, you smell the rind of the orange. Love it. You put it in your mouth, you taste that whiskey and that orange after. It's just heaven. So there's becoming more kind of, I would say, artisan, more invention around flavored whiskey, so we do both. What's the premium on acquisitions right now? Because I feel like these specialty liqueurs and people who are experimenting, coming up with something different, they're in, people want them, companies want them. They really do, and I would tell you, it's kind of all over the board, yeah. and I would tell okay. you, because tequilas have exploded, 
some of the recent acquisitions. Is it too much? It's I too mean, much. No offense. Celebrities love you. George Clooney <laughs> loved you. But I mean, it feels like everybody's creating a tequila. They are. And what's really matters is quality tequila. That's where we are now, right? That's what's going to win in the end. So we just bought Codigo, mm, which mm-hmm. is a very high-end, super premium. It's got this rosé, believe it or not, rosé tequila. Oh, wait till you put it in your mouth. So it's it's now about Doesn't being... have to go in a margarita. <laughs> no, it does not. Um, actually, I'll tell you about what could go into a margarita that you wouldn't expect, but I'll come to that in a second. Is but it what peanut I, butter? No, well, no, it's mezcal. <laughs> oh. Del oh. Maguey mezcal, which is the number one mezcal, uh, okay. which is yeah. ours. But you make a margarita with it, and it's got that little extra smoke. It's unbelievable. I have to get it for my brother. He's a great margarita maker. Oh, this is (laughs) it, right? listening. Yes. And so I will tell you now is the time for, I mean, people just love to experiment. Yeah, I agree. And that's post-COVID, right? Because people like they were, you know, making cocktails and all experiential. It's all about the experience. And so having that right portfolio, making sure you're on the trend of all the things that are growing is really, really critical. You know, and over the years, uh, consolidation has been such a big theme in the beverage industry. You know, all the beer companies getting rolled up until we have two majors. Um, I'm kind of surprised to see this Brown Foreman news today. They're selling uh, the Finlandia vodka brand. Did you want it? Would you have wanted it? No, okay. (laughs) We have absolute. No, we have the best. (laughs) I was just going to say. But but are the big, is the big deal making in this space has it run its course? Have all the big deals that can be done, have they been done? And now it's it's looking for these new growth, uh, yeah. small batch type of things? Well, no, I think you're going to see it in both areas. So uh, it did not surprise me about the, the, the deal today with Coke. You have to understand, both Coke and Pepsi, right, having worked at PepsiCo, you know, these are much narrower margin businesses. Yeah. Um, a lot of the carbonated soft drinks business is declining. So these yeah. people are looking for new profit pools. Yeah. So you're seeing a lot of these companies try to get into the alcohol business. Yeah. And, you know, Coke went early with Tapa Chico and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and so Pepsi's gone with Mountain Dew. And so they're now. Does look- it make sense to you to bolt on liquor onto a, a soft drink company? So l- let me put it this way. I, I love competition. OK, yeah. um, we're, we're about to do uh, absolute ready to drink with uh, Ocean Spray. Like it's it's like the biggest thing. Every retailer. I want to, ready to drink. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about that when we're we go back. But, but here's the thing. The reason they're getting into it is because they need more profit. They need more margin. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting about vodka right now in the industry is it's declining. The only thing that's grown is Tito's. Really? Yeah, it's declining. Anything that's white is declining. Gin, vodka, rum, all declining. Huh. Okay? Huh. And so what's happening is you've got the spirit company saying, oh, I don't want to be in there. And so, But you've got these, these you know, soft drink companies are like, I want to get in. Right. What I would say, because I'm about to take over as chairman of Discus, which is the trade association, mm-hmm. and I've said this to some of my friends at PepsiCo, do it responsibly. I, I cannot tolerate, under any circumstances, brands coming in, uh, you know, and using kid uh, packaging, yeah. advertising in the kids' aisle, it's unacceptable. And it, you know, we have a responsibility as an industry. We've seen it with electronic cigarettes, right? Come on, oh, folks. Like, yes. own it up, do the responsible thing. Talking with Anne McCurgy, she is CEO of Pernod Ricard, North America. She's in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Um, and I was thinking about, I mean, your brands, I had a list here. I should just have you do it. Absolute, Jameson, Kahlua, Hard Liquor, Spirits, Champagne. I mean, I'm leaving out a lot. I think there's 240 brands overall. We just talked about Screwball, uh, super premium peanut butter flavored American whiskey. How do you think about changes to the portfolio um, and, and, and whether it's expansions, getting rid of, how do you think about it? So, you know, what's great about um, our portfolio is it's very premium and we have... And you want to keep that. And we want to really keep that because if you look at... No two buck chuck? No. <laughs> well, you know, good for trade shows. Okay, so, but what I tell you is um, when you think about consumption of alcohol, right, we all don't drink the same thing every time we drink. When, we're, when, when we want to celebrate, we want to drink champagne, right? We want to just relax and unwind. We might want a glass of bourbon, right? When we want to impress somebody, we might want to take out a very high-end cognac, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody drinks the same thing. Why they drink is the context in which they're in. So when you have the right premium portfolio that goes across all these different occasions, you actually have an advantage. And our strategy at Pernod Ricard is literally to activate more brands than our competition with the same cost to serve. Yeah. Huh. So, But you have to do that if you know the science behind the demand, which brand belongs in which occasion, so you don't cannibalize yourself. So that so is certain brands are really out front and center at certain yeah. times of the year, if you will? So, so, so for instance, during St. Patrick's Day, 
is Jameson, right? right? In the summer, you're drinking Malibu, right? right? So there are seasons, there are occasions, sometimes some occasions are year long, right? So you have to then devise a portfolio and that's how you decide which brands you buy and which ones you sell. It, your, your business model, it's like that Chumbawamba song, you know, you got a whiskey drink, a vodka drink, a cider drink, <laughs> you a got it. song. But, uh, <laughs> <My freaking. laughs> but at, at the same time, you know, we all do drink different drinks at different times for different occasions, but also just in general, I get the impression that liquor consumers are a fickle group, you know, <laughs> One year it's craft beer is the hot thing. The next year it's seltzers. Yeah. Uh, the next year it's yeah. fine wine. So how do you get ahead of that as yeah. an executive in this industry? So we actually monitor the trends around how people are drinking in segments. Um, so on average, in any given month, a consumer will drink about 45 drinks. Okay, That, that includes everything. Okay, A, a month? A month, 45. right? So... Now, I'm out of those, a Friday night I am for a you, mega, no, I'm a mega lightweight, but go ahead. <laughs> but what we've seen, and this is on average, right? Some people drink way less. Yeah. So what you see on average is before the pandemic, 45 of those drinks, were 20 of them were beer, okay? After the pandemic, they've lost two whole drinks. There's only 18 of them now for beer. Mm -hmm. And what gained mm -hmm. was your spirit RTDs, uh, spirits themselves, wine also lost. Ready to drink? Yeah, it's on fire. It's yeah. on fire because people are walking away from beer. Then they went to malted RTDs, but they're like, eh, taste isn't so great. How much is that growing, the RTD? Ready oh to drink? my God. It's, for you guys? For us, it's it's exponential growth. It's like 50%. Like it's, it's huge. Year over year? Yeah, it's huge. <gasps> but off a small base? Off a small base. Okay. Off a small base. Okay. Could it be a bigger base? It could very much a bigger base. I mean, we have RTDs in Absolute. We have it in uh, Malibu, uh, Jameson. And in Absolute, we're just about to launch our Ready to Drink with Ocean Spray. You know, so you think about you know, we were talking about the, you know, the, the, the wonderful cocktail that yeah. we're all used to, which is the Cosmo. And so it's, uh, it's here, here's the big thing. Consumers post pandemic want cocktails conveniently, period. That's what it is. Yeah. I'm not a good, I know people who are really into it and they get the gear and they're like, yeah. love it. I'm like, uh, just give me the bottle. Let me throw it over some ice. Yeah, I'll tell you a great example. So this is, it helps you understand the occasion. Women will get together, call it once a week, they'll have book club, whatever, they'll yeah. drink their glass of Chardonnay, and that's fine, because it's easy to pour. You know, after week after week of Chardonnay, you're like, I really want a cocktail. <laughs> but nobody wants to make a cocktail, so we launched Ready to Drink Altos Margarita. And literally, all you do is pour it like you would wine, and it's an instant margarita, and I'm telling you, this thing is bar quality. And so now we're sourcing right. from wine, as a as a tequila, it's pretty wild. Like you just get your head around it. But I I sampled some over the summer and um, was really surprised at how good they were. Listen, we'd be remiss we're Bloomberg booze, yeah. great leading indicator, especially because you play into the premium side of things, of how the luxury market is going right now. How are the numbers in terms of this economy and then going into next year? How would you describe it? How are you seeing it? Yeah, so, you know. Any slowdown? It, it, well, we're, we're getting past COVID, right? And COVID was a big boom. People were stocking up, et cetera, et cetera. The economy has been tough. Um, we're seeing retailers actually bring down their inventories a bit because mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. the cost of capital with interest rates is mm -hmm. really, really hard. Well, that's interesting. Um, we have the whole, we have that whole global supply chain crisis. Now that's over. So what's what's happening is we're seeing resiliency in consumers drinking. So, you know, the sellout and what people are consuming. But now the inventory situation is kind of, you know, kind of settling out. So when you look at the numbers, you know, from a net sales or a shipments perspective, it's lower than actually what people are buying because there's a little bit of over inventory in the industry. But if you ask me long term, you, you said those numbers in the beginning of the program, like about 6% right. CAGR, right? Right. Pre-pandemic, that's we were going 4 or 5% every f year. In the pandemic, it was double digits, right? Yeah. Uh, this is now the post-COVID kind of shakeout, and I think as you move forward, right. you're going to go right back to that 4 to 5%. I love hearing about this. You've given us a snapshot on the economy. You and I and Mike were talking in the break about drinking responsibly. Yes. You guys have a campaign. We have about 45, 50 seconds left here. Just talk to us about that. Yeah, so... I feel like you can't do one without the other. Yeah, so we believe on return on responsibility as much as return on investment. Everything from working with the government to get the HALT Right Act, to get breathalyzers in cars so you cannot drive if you are drunk. We do a safe nights program. We actually donated something called Engage Responsibly to stop hate online. And, you know, we, we're trying to do everything that we can to be responsible. And, you know, this call out to all my other competitors. Let's, we're working together. Let's 
work together. Let's make it the right thing. I to love do. it. So cars are going to be equipped. You cannot. Yeah. Start your car yeah. if you have alcohol. When do we get this? So it's a law, and now the car companies are trying to figure out Come how on, to get car it done. Company. Exactly. Come on, you got the UAW out of the way. <laughs> Let's get this together. I know that that is a very important issue for you, um, yes. and we so appreciate you coming in. This was fun. Thank you. Come back soon. I promise. With champagne. Or you got it. Next time <laughs> no, I will be kidding. I'm fully loaded. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> this was a great way to wrap up. Thank what, you. you guys for It's been so far a, a pretty crazy week. Uh, Anne McCurgy, she is CEO of Pernod Ricard, North America, in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Carol Master, Mike Regan. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Recent years have seen an explosion of boycotts and pressure campaigns aimed at everything from consumer companies, think Disney, Target, Bud Light, that's a little hint everybody, to tech giants including Google, Facebook and X, to big banks and money managers, BlackRock, JP Morgan, Citigroup, a lot of targets. Yeah, it's actually kind of hard to keep up. There are so many boycotts and pressure campaigns. It's what Josh Green writes about when it comes to the polarizing cultural fights that dominate American public life. Also how they've poured into the consumer world turning corporate America into a new battlefield when it comes to U.S. politics. Check out his story. It can be found on the Bloomberg Terminal at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Josh, as national correspondent for Bloomberg Business Week, he's also the author of Devil's Bargain, Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, and the Storming of the Presidency. He joins us on the phone from Washington, D.C. Also here is Joel Weber, the editor of the magazine. He's in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio back in New York. Joel, there's a man who's got a company helping to navigate the culture wars. And he's got an interesting past. Did, a top didn't data start scientist there. For yeah. President Donald Trump's first presidential campaign. Yeah, yeah. didn't, um, didn't but start he saw, there. He saw the 2016 election coming. Well, he was, uh, as Josh writes, and this is part of this culture wars package that we've been working on this week. And I thought from the minute Josh started talking about this, that this was a sort of a maybe the most important story in the package uh, because it hmm. showed that, you know, this person who is a top data scientist for Donald Trump in 2016 took those lessons from what he saw and why uh, the public underestimate or the press especially underestimated Donald Trump and then turned that into something that he could talk to companies about. Um, and so I was just really curious about what that looks like because you're right, you mentioned Bud Light there earlier, uh, Target, like all of these, the culture wars have come to corporate America and yet there was someone who saw saw what what it was all about before anybody else and i just thought that was a really interesting insight and those insights are actually incredibly valuable and something that i want to talk to josh about so so josh uh shy trumpers who found them so the, the the guy we're talking about here is a data scientist, a Republican data scientist named Matt Askowski, who who has actually appeared in Business Week magazine before in 2016 because uh, longtime readers will remember that I was deeply embedded with the Trump campaign and during the 2016 race. And a few weeks before the election, when everybody expected Trump to lose, uh, me and a colleague got invited down. We're the only reporters allowed inside Trump's big data headquarters in San Antonio, where he was doing all his kind of um, you know, Facebook data cooking and all that kind of stuff. And I met Matt Oskowski on that trip. He was the head of Trump's data team. And he was the guy who was pushing the idea that was really laughed at at the time, that there was a hidden tribe of Trump voters. You know, some people call them shy Trumpers or hidden Trumpers. But Matt, in his data, was seeing that there were a lot of people who didn't ordinarily vote Republican who were really turned on by Donald Trump. They didn't care about taxes and... Uh, you know, financial deregulation. They cared about immigration, wages, law and order. They tended to be rural. They tended to be older. And they were very, very angry and loyal to Donald Trump. And uh, on the night that Trump won that election, um, me and my colleague pulled an all-nighter. We got Matt on the phone at 2 a.m. on election night, and he sort of explained this all to us. Became a Business Week cover story the next day. Um, and, and basically what I did in the story is kind of pick up the thread, because Matt had a fascinating career since then. Um, in the week after the election, obviously everybody wanted to know in politics, like, how did you guys do this? 
But his phone started blowing up. He told me at the time, not so much from political people, but from corporate brands and ad agencies and even professional sports teams. Um, you know, he, he spent the next few months sort of circling the globe, giving these talks about how it was he sort of identified this group of people and whether or not um, the kind of insights that he'd had about what he called uh, voters' cultural consciousness could be applied to the corporate space. And Matt thought it could and started this company um, that we write about in the issue this time, taking those same insights uh, and explaining how they kind of manifest themselves in the consumer arena, especially lately and especially in terms of these kind of culture war boycotts we've seen around brands like Target uh, and Bud Light. Okay, so that's the thing that, as you write, we saw what Trump was able to accomplish in the political realm. And even during his presidency, we started to see it trickle over into uh, into the corporate realm. What we've seen post-Trump presidency is that has gone to 11. And if you're a business leader in this country, it just feels like you you and your company uh, could end up, you know, stepping in it again and again and again. So where does, how does Oskowski uh, help corporations now? Well, you know, his big insight with Trump and, and the motivations of voters was that what like normie political consultants didn't understand, Republican and Democrat, was that it's really kind of mal- values and morals driving people's behavior, kind of cultural consciousness that people just kind of come to the decisions in their lives through this lens of politics. And it's not just political decisions that they bring that lens to. It's also increasingly kind of consumer ones. So what he told me at the time was you know, he was going around talking to these companies. And ironically, one of the companies he talked to was Anheuser-Busch, which, which makes Bud Light. But what he was trying to tell them was that, look, your, your, your customers are kind of coming at the marketplace in a different way than maybe they did have before. And this is something you should pay attention to. So I think his insight this year has, has proven itself over and over. You know, back in March, Bud Light launched this very controversial uh, ad campaign with a transgender influencer. I mean, I remember talking to Matt at the time saying, you know, this doesn't make any sense because if you look at who Bud Light's consumers are, and this is the sort of thing he studies, you know, they are, a lot of them are, uh, you know, white, male, football, sports fans, you know, the furthest thing you could get from the type of people who'd be um, positively influenced by a transgender Instagram influencer. And sure enough, uh, it, you know, it blew up in right wing circles. It became viral on social media of, of, you know, angry kind of Trumpers going in and smashing up displays of Bud Light and Bud Light sales fell fairly precipitously kind of in the weeks after that. Um, so I think it goes to highlight this this sort of factor um, that he studies um, consumers, corporate, uh, uh, sorry, consumers, cultural consciousness and how that applies itself to different brands. And it's important to point out, this isn't just Republicans. Um, a lot of the boycott activity, and especially the political boycott activity, emanated on the right long before Bud Light. Uh, and ironically enough, the real catalyst for that was Oskowski's old boss, Donald Trump, who once he got elected president, um, as we all remember, drove all kinds of um, corporate boycotts, you know, liberals pressuring companies to denounce Trump and and really kind of upended the way that corporate brands deal with the political space. So, Josh, uh, Oskowski launches a data intelligence company, Human Behavior Now, and that's his the main vehicle that he's using to, like, look out at corporate trends and and consumer behavior. Right. And Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, like when one thing that you write about here is that the, there are obviously the two extremes on on both the left and the right, but actually the thing that drives change is that moderate middle. Talk to us about what he's observed there. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we had him do for this piece was to kind of go out and give us like a, a, a deck, like survey research. Okay, who are the people actually boycotting? Like, who are they? Where do they live? What are their motivations? And what effect are they having? And he came back with some really inf- interesting information. Um, first of all, the people boycotting the conservatives are not necessarily all the kind of Trump supporters we remember from the campaign. By and large, they're not rural the way Trump supporters were. They're suburbanites. And the liberals are tend, tend to kind of cluster in cities, as you might expect. Um, the other thing was, and this reminded me of kind of social media, there have been studies showing that the political content on Twitter is mainly produced, like 90% of it is produced by people on the far right and the far left, and everybody else just kind of 
you know, gets, gets hit with it when they log on. Very much uh, the same thing with these consumer boycotts, that it's really driven by activists on the left and the right, but that there was this large, what he called, movable middle of people who don't really care initially, you know, whether their soap or their beer has a political view on this or that, but eventually end up getting pulled in once this stuff gets picked up by the media. And we have a guy in the piece, a FedEx driver who I talked to, big Bud Light drinker, really hadn't been involved in politics, really hadn't cared about some of the fights like Target and Disney. Um, but when the Bud Light transgender influencer thing came out, he said, you know, that was the last straw and he quit drinking Bud Light. And I think that's a good example of kind of what's happening nationally. Uh, you know, a lot of people aren't waking up in the morning um, wanting to think hard about, you know, what political stances their brands are taking. Um, and yet it's become enough of a hot button issue, especially in the political arena, especially in the Republican presidential race, that people are noticing and we're having more and more evidence now that they're responding to it. What I love about this story is, Josh, and it's in the piece, too, is it's like, when the heck did Republicans get so angry with business? You thought they were so kind of hand in hand. So it's really, if you think about it, kind of big picture in terms of what's happening, it's like, what the heck happened? So spin it forward for us or, or take it forward for us, because it does make you wonder about what does come next. And I know you, you know, he, this individual talks specifically about a parallel economy. So I'm curious about some of that. Yeah, well, the, the idea of a parallel economy is that it's the idea that, uh, you know, just as American politics is kind of polarized between liberals and conservatives, so too will the kind of conservative, or sorry, will, will, will the consumer sphere. And, you know, there's a little bit of evidence that this is happening. Um, there's a, you know, company went public a few years ago called Black Rifle Coffee, which presents itself as kind of an, a conservative alternative to Starbucks. Um, you know, Business Week, we've written about, like, Razor, there's a conservative Razor company. I've written about conservative exchange-traded funds that are anti-ESG. So there's a little bit of basis for thinking that. I personally have a hard time believing it because, um, you know, we, we don't have any mm -hmm. big conservative brands that are, you know, Disney clones or, you know, GE clones or even like a Bud Light clone, frankly. Um, but what seems indisputable is that politics has infected the corporate consumer sphere in a way that it's really hard to kind of untangle from. And the real catalyst there, I think, was, was uh, George Floyd's death in 2020, where a lot of brands, almost every brand kind of came out and made these statements about social justice um, that aligned very much with Democrats. Uh, and that caused a lot of pressure on uh, on those brands, both from the left to continue speaking out about political issues, and also a backlash from the right that we've now seen risen up um, with these campaigns against Target and against Bud Light for taking, you know, quote unquote, woke positions on a lot of these issues. Uh, and it's also become uh, a vehicle for presidential candidates like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who didn't really mm -hmm. want to take on Donald Trump directly. So what he did was to start a lot of big cultural fights with companies like Disney and to try and have mm -hmm. these culture war debates that would raise his profile as a presidential candidate. So I think um, activists on both sides, but especially on the Republican side, have realized that there is utility in politicizing uh, the consumer space. And, and that's why we're seeing more and more of this. I mean, is this something that ends after the primaries or is this something that goes into the general election where we have, um, you know, whoever the nominee is continuing with uh, this idea of uh, attacks on corporate companies as in, in the context of a culture war? You know, it's a great question. I spoke to a professor in the piece who works with business leaders and, and surveys them on issues of politics. And the answer seems to be that a lot of CEOs have become embroiled in politics and now are having second thoughts about it. Like maybe we don't want to be in the crosshairs. Maybe we don't want to be subject to kind of these boycotts. But once you've gotten in, it's tough to get out. And one example of that is the pressure that a lot of these companies um, feel themselves to be under to speak out about the October 7th uh, Hamas attack right. on Israel. Not Good something point. that a lot of people want to do, and yet it's hard Go. It's hard not to weigh in. We got to run. Josh and Joel, thank you. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. 
well as conservative politicians bring the rhetoric and beliefs of the evangelical right into mainstream classrooms, reshaping American public education, liberal families are using the right's hard-won homeschooling protections to give their children a secular education in kitchens and living rooms across the country. This is from a story from the Bloomberg Business Week team. Yeah, with more on how culture wars here in the U.S. are leading to another deep blow to public education. With us right now is Charlie Locke. She's Bloomberg Business Week freelance contributor. Joining us on Zoom from Portland, Oregon. Her story can be found on the Bloomberg Terminal and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Also here with us in the Bloomberg studio, the editor of Bloomberg Business Week, Joel Weber. Joel, um, good to have you with us. Charlie, good to have you with us. I love this story because when you think homeschooling, there's this image of who the typical homeschooler and homeschoolee is in the U.S., and this is is sort of a you know puts that entire theory or, or image on its head. Story's kind of changing a little bit. Um, so we were working on this package of stories around America and culture wars, and this idea of homeschooling came up. It, homeschooling has, has long been a thing that conservatives have fought for mainly. What we're seeing though is as the politics, um, especially around education, have begun to change and in conservative strongholds, we've seen a stronger uh, intervention in classrooms to even change curriculum. In states that are conservative, we're seeing mostly liberal leaning parents begin to take advantage of the homeschooling uh, kind of push that was championed by especially uh, evangelicals. Uh, so Charlie, bring us in, bring you in here. Um, tell us how the yeah, story came to you. Yeah. yeah, so I write about kids and education a lot for a number of different outlooks, outlets, including Bloomberg. And I have noticed over the past few years, just more and more families that I have talked to in the course of my everyday reporting were considering homeschooling, particularly families in red states where there is this um, increasingly conservative politicization of public education education, whether that is uh, in terms of what it's like for kids of color or trans or gay kids to go to public school or in terms of curriculum and how kids are learning about American history or um, what they're not learning. And I've just talked to more and more parents who were kind of at their wits end about what to do. And it made me really curious about, okay, is there this movement of, uh, is it really changing what it means to homeschool your kids and who's taking advantage of that? Because, particularly because as you mentioned, the history of homeschooling in the past 30 or 40 years has really been built around the evangelical right who have pushed really hard for the rights of homeschoolers and particularly uh, a certain type of homeschooling that, that really leaves it all in the hands mm -hmm. of the parent without a lot of oversight. And so in, uh, in states with big evangelical communities like Florida, which I focus on in the story, there's, there are a lot of rights and a lot of resources for homeschoolers because it's been pushed for from this particular demographic background. But now because of how public schools are changing and how politicians uh, in conservative places are kind of adopting the rhetoric around um, a parental bill of rights or um, kind of around school choice, picking up all this rhetoric that the, home, the far right homeschooling movement has used for a long time. Right. It's pushing liberal families out of well, public schools. Well, Charlie, can you talk a little bit about some of the most, I don't want to use the term egregious, but the anecdotes mm. that you found or, or kind of what pushed these parents over the edge. You, you said what they're teaching or what they're not teaching when it comes to American history. I was so surprised to read in your story um, some of the things that, that did motivate these parents to, to move them to homeschool their kids. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one that was really striking to me is one mom that I talked to in Florida whose twins were in sixth grade in public school in Florida last year, and their history teacher taught them that uh, that um, Manifest Destiny referred to Native Americans who decided to move west because they wanted to try somewhere else and have more space. Uh, and she, the mom looked at the curriculum and looked at the slides from that day's class. She didn't really she thought maybe her kids had misunderstood the lesson and the slides had nothing about the Trail of Tears, you know, really presented Manifest Destiny as, um, as this happy choice that Native people in the Southeast made. Um, I mean, there are other parents I talked to, one mom whose 
um, all of the books were removed from her kids' elementary school in classrooms and in the school library. And for, I think, six months last year, there were just no books at school and kids weren't allowed to bring them because books hadn't gone through the Florida approval system yet. And she felt like, I can't send my kid to a school that isn't allowed to have any books in it. I mean, pretty egregious <laughs> moves. Yeah. yeah. This is America today. Um, what's interesting, too, is I feel like... Um, I wonder about the people, Tim and I were talking about this actually before we got going, is these people, were they nervous about talking to you? And, and we're curious about how you found them. Was it difficult um, to find them? Yeah, a lot of the families were quite nervous about talking to me. And we do grant anonymity to a, a number of the parents in this article. I mean, it, there's there's a real risk. I think that for a lot of these families, there's a real risk both that you know, in their communities that they would um, be ostracized because of some of the choices that they're making. And also in terms of the support that they're getting, states like Florida actually give money to homeschooling families to to support them and support homeschooling. And some of the moms in particular in the story talked about how they really feel this tension between um, wanting those finances from the state of Florida or other states to be able to support their kids' education, but also not wanting to take away money from public schools. And so they don't want to have their name in there to uh, jeopardize the funding that's enabling their kids to learn at home. But um, right. you know, a lot of how, I'm, I, you know, building a story like this takes a really long time. And I, I spent about six months building relationships with people who run communities like the CE Homeschoolers Group um, on Facebook and kind of building community with people who, who are educators of homeschoolers. And then a lot of it is word of mouth, talking to one mom who connects me to her local group, who connects me to someone else who'll talk to me. Charlie, I'm interested from the, especially from the mothers you talked to, and you made it, I, I thought, a very clear point in the story about how mom centric all of this is. I, I am curious, like, does this feel just like a permanent shift for them, or are they contemplating moving because of this? Like, how, what's the, what's the, what are the long term implications that you got a sense of from your reporting? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it's a very family to family question. I think a lot of these parents, this is not an ideal solution for them and for their kids. There's a lot that they're having to sacrifice, particularly so many moms who uh, were working in professional workplaces before this and felt like their only option was to step back and full time homeschool their kids. Uh, but it's not very sustainable financially for their family. It's not really what they want in terms of their careers and time. Um, and some families are trying to figure out how to move out of state. I mean, it's hard to uproot your life and do that, right? Um, and other families who are kind of hoping that things will get better and hope that by the time their kids are in high school, uh, they'll be able to send their kids back to public school. But it, it's it's kind of uh, trying to make the, the least bad decision for a lot of these families. You know, the other thing that um, this your story explores is as people leave public schools, that it creates this downward spiral. And since 2020, you, you cite 1.2 million K through 12 students have left public education in, in the US. The same people who once celebrated the institutions, once they leave like this, it means that the schools end up taking a tax hit too, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it means pretty substantial and honestly pretty scary hits for public school, both because Public schools are mostly funded by uh, by taxes within communities and by allocations federally based on how many students are enrolled in a public school. And so when a bunch of families pull their kids from public school, it means the schools get less money federally because they have less students enrolled there. And it also means that they get less money uh, locally because there's less support for taxes. If you're not sending your own kids to the public school, you don't care as much about uh, about about supporting those financially through your taxes. And then there are also all of these um, kind of softer effects too, where a lot of these parents, the parents who are able to uh, step back from work full time and homeschool their kids are also parents who previously were really involved at the public school in terms of being on the PTA or running fundraising drives or leading field trips. And so there's a lot of, a lot of kind of the ways that um, public schools provide a lot of social services for families who need them. Um, they will be less and less able to do that as more and more families who can opt out decide to opt out. So many aspects of this story, just, you know, the trend in parental rights, um, the implications for moms and working women, um, and what it means, you know, Joel, for public school systems going forward. Does not look good. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, 
what I think it shows is the commitment of families, right? And yeah. like the the fact that they saw what was happening and tried to do something about it. Incredible story. Um, that, of course, is the editor of Business Week, Joel Weber, and Charlie Locke wrote the story, Bloomberg Business Week Freelance Contributor. You can find it um, on the Bloomberg Terminal, of course, at Bloomberg dot com slash business week you're listening to the bloomberg business week podcast catch us live weekday afternoons from three to six eastern listen on bloomberg.com the iheart radio app and the bloomberg business app or watch us live on youtube when i was a kid carol yes and i needed to raise money for you know something at school we did walkathons for charity we did school trips I did it the old-fashioned way, okay? This was the 90s. Keep that in mind, okay? Yep. I went door-to-door with a clipboard. I rang doorbells. I actually wore, wore rollerblades. I could so I could so do it quicker. That. So I could go door So 1990s. Quicker. So Southern California, 1990s. I should have skateboarded, actually. <laughs> well, it was, of course, before smartphones. Kids these days have other options, such as the one developed by our next guest, Cole Morgan, the founder and CEO of Snap Mobile. It's a digital fundraising tool that high schoolers can use to raise money for schools, teams, clubs, and more. Cole's here with us in the Bloomberg studio. Cole, good to have you with us this afternoon. I should note, you raised $700 million uh, for 100,000 plus groups and teams. That's a lot. That's uh, a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah we're talking about some Pretty serious money here. Talk to yes. us a little bit about the platform, and, and also I'm interested in, in the business model here and Thank the take you. rate. Yeah, so we, uh, so I, was, I would just say thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, when I called my mom and told her the idea for the business, I told her we were going to raise a million dollars for schools. Uh, How old were you? I was 28 at the time, 38 now. Um, and now, and I do, we're actually approaching about $800 million given back to schools so far. Wow. Um, so yeah, so we've uh, we started a few years, started 10 years ago. We're in about half the schools in the United States. Um, we focus on financial transparency in schools and helping groups of people raise money for a common cause where a lot of the crowdfunding platforms online focus on individuals raising money come in quickly sign up we help groups of people with that require oversight so the school your club organization um, you know where somebody actually needs to oversee the financials of the of the group we help that group raise money and so the money goes directly to the organization or to the school or to the nonprofit or whatever it is rather than the individual so how does it work uh, kids log in they yeah. send uh, send out emails text message social media uh, January 1st we're launching a mobile apps so we'll have over a million kids download our mobile app uh, next year so there's no mobile app up to now no it's all been a web app Wow! Because a web app, That's really uh, a web app was faster. Um, huh. A web app, we had we actually had a mobile app when we very first started, but it would show up. You'd try to get all these kids to download a mobile app. It would take too long. But that was ten years ago, and kids weren't. They kept thinking they were downloading Snapchat. That had happened. That's okay. happened. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So they. So they. Now they log in, they download the mobile app, and they, they go through the flow. You know, they, they send out their emails to friends and family. I'm sure you guys have actually probably gotten an email I from a, a niece or a nephew to yeah. donate to a, a, but it's, is a it, fine arts is it or an athletic label, program. Though? No, it's, no. So it'll take you to a site that shows you that it is Snap Mobile? It's, yeah, we'll show you that. So that, that part of the platform is called Snap Raise. And it'll take you to that. It'll actually take you to that kids fundraising page because mm -hmm. what we know is that people want to support kids and the causes that the kids care about. So it's not about supporting the actual football team directly. It's about supporting the kid who's mm -hmm. a part of the football team. Uh, so it actually will take you to when my son starts using the platform. He's only two. Um, it'll take you to Luke Preston Morgan's uh, you know football page. And you'll, Luke will have a goal, and then the team will have a goal above that. So it's a hierarchical structure that allows the team to raise money. So all 100 kids on the football team are raising money at the same time for, do, the, for the same cause. You do live in Texas. You're already thinking about football, and your kid's only two. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I played football. We live in Texas. This is the it's, whole company is surrounded by it. Yeah. It seems so logical. Yes. So what was it that... What was the idea initially that you said, okay, this, this, we've got something here? Yes, it's a, it's a very simple idea. It's, it, it looks more simple on the surface than it actually is underneath. So we have an entire organizational database that connects school administration all the way to the communities in which they live and that support them. So there's, there's a lot of data and infrastructure, financial transparency, oversight, security, compliance. Right. But on the surface, it was really simple. I was selling discount cards and cookie dough in schools after I got done 
uh, playing football and a coach said to me, we love that you're here, but we hate why you're here. Uh, so there's gotta be a better way. This is the honest to goodness story. It's on our website. Yeah. Um, I said, what do you mean? He said, our kids, you know, we need help. We need to raise money, but we don't want to do the things that you're making us do, which is sell all these things. The school doesn't like that we take cash. The kids don't want to sell things. The parents don't want to buy things. They just want to support. So I said, okay, just like my whole life, I've taken coaching. So it's like, what do I do? So I looked around the school and I saw every kid on their phone and I started asking friends and family and people at bars and restaurants. I said, do you care about supporting kids? And they would say yes. And then I would say, do you have cash in your wallet? And they would say no. <laughs> and I would say, do you have your phone? And they would say yes. And I would say, do you have your credit card? And they would say yes. And so I just put together the idea of the phone, the credit card, and kids asking politely for community and family support. So what's your take rate? Our take rate is 20%. Wow. Yeah. That's very high. That's it's, much higher than I thought it would be. So of every yeah. dollar that is donated, yeah. your platform takes 20%. Yeah. Yes. I was expecting two or three percent. Yeah. It's a it's a high take rate for what we for you know what you think of in the world of crowdfunding. But if you look at, you know, some of the other individual platforms, they just tack it on in a different way. We don't do that. Um, we there's a service-based model for us. So we help organize, coordinate, promote, maintain, and manage the entire online fundraising event. So we're not the cheapest thing in fundraising, but we are the cheapest thing in school-based fundraising, which is a very different thing because when you sell discount cards and cookies, you're only making 50%. That's 160 million, I was just doing some calculations here, $160 million. But that's a big difference because you think about, yeah. you know, whether it's Girl Scout cookies or what have you, you're mm -hmm. saying that the kids only get 50%. Yeah, sometimes less. Sometimes less. Yeah, Do, are you because only there's a product involved. Sometimes, yeah, but you can hide behind the you can hide behind the the fact that the product is there. But I'll be honest but, yeah. with you, having done that for nieces and nephews and mm -hmm. buying wrapping paper and stuff that I really don't want, I'd rather have just given them money. Yeah. But that's not the way it was set up. Are you going to only stay with schools? I don't mean only, but no, we were. We're. I mean, we are the largest you know youth organization fundraising platform as well. Yeah. Um, it's just our main focus is schools. Uh, but we grow into the we grow into the youth side as well. Yeah. One of the other things that we provide for the twenty percent take rate is financial oversight and compliance for every dollar that comes into your school. So you know, there's a school actually locally that an athletic secretary absconded with some of the money, and because they were a SNAP client, this just happened a few weeks ago. Mm. Uh, because they were a SNAP client, they were actually going and have a full audit trail. Mm of every one of the donations and the dollars that came in and they were able to help find out that uh, what that athletic secretary had done. Do you, what happened? Uh, are you profitable? We are not. Where we, are you spending all the money? You've raised 800 million, you've, 800 million dollars has gone to schools, which means 160 million dollars has come to you guys if we're yep. doing 20%. Yep. Where's the money going? Uh, investment into the technology. We've acquired a couple companies as well. We've acquired three businesses so far. Um, we've also raised capital as well. $90 million in a series B mm -hmm. led by the investment group that owns the LA Dodgers. Yes. Back Eldridge. in 2021. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we've, we've hired, uh, we invest in hiring outside salespeople. Um, so our, our sales force, we have 150 boots on the ground that actually serve the communities in which they live. So is so, that your highest overhead or is it that in technology? Uh, it's that and technology. So we've also scaled up our technology team as well. 30 seconds left here. What's the, what's the end game? Is it to go public? The end game is to build a transformative platform that supports teachers and students, and, it's teachers and athletic directors and coaches the way that they support their kids. You know, football background with me, so I focus on the process. If we build a great company that serves the needs of all of our customers, then who knows what happens. But you stay, you're going to stay within, like, helping, for the most part, schools? Or can schools, it expand? Schools, youth organizations, colleges. Yep. It can yeah. grow. Yeah, it can That's, grow quite a bit. There's a little bit of a growth runway there. It's <laughs> a big market for us. Yeah, and imagine sure. a moat, too, with getting the schools signed on. That's a hard part. Yeah. It's incredibly hard. And it's one of the reasons you have to invest the, the way that we're investing. Come back and let us know how things are going. I promise. Really interesting. Cole Morgan, founder and CEO of Snap Mobile, uh, joining us here in our Bloomberg Studio. Good luck. We'll talk to you soon again. Thank you. 
This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.